for the two marshmallows in 20 minutes have higher SAT scores when they take them, they stay in school longer, less likely to drop out, higher self-esteem, better relationships, better at handling stress, fewer symptoms of personality disorders, they attain higher degrees, they earn more money, they're less likely to use drugs. That's interesting, isn't it? So a little four or five year old that somehow has the self-control to not eat that marshmallow will then grow up and in many ways be a better person. That's pretty wild, isn't it? Now they do the same kind of studies on adults, and, and, and most of us probably don't care for marshmallows as much as like a four or five year old, but they use money. And they'll say, you know, would you get more, do you want five dollars now or do you want forty dollars in two weeks? And you can imagine the same kind of process, right? Do I want the short-term immediate reward right now, or can I delay that gratification? And the research findings are similar when they trace the personality types of the people that can wait. If you can wait for the money, you'll get higher grades, you'll weigh less, you'll exercise more, and you'll pay off your credit cards each month. Now they do similar studies specifically on college students. So this is important for y'all. And again, keep that idea in mind. Delayed gratification versus instant gratification. If you're a college student who can hold off on the marshmallow or the money, you'll get better grades, you'll have fewer eating disorders, you'll drink less, both important for college students. You have fewer psychosomatic aches and pains, you're less depressed, less anxious, less phobic, you have a higher self-esteem, better relationships with your family, more stable friendships, less likely to have sex that you regret, less likely to imagine yourself cheating in a monogamous relationship. In other words, if you have self-control, you'll live a better life. That's pretty wild, isn't it? It's one of the most important variables in determining you, whether you get what you want, is whether you have self-control. Self-control equals a better life. Now, the question is, what can we do about that? And that's a nice transition into my third point. And we'll call this willpower. But we'll clearly see a connection between self-control and willpower. A good question to think about for you is, what are your marshmallows? It's here, right? In a, in, a, in a metaphorical sense, right? What do you, what do you need to say now? Nah, I can wait on that. Good question to think about. I'd encourage you, I talk to my students a lot about this a lot. One of the, the, the most helpful, I think, kind of hooks to hang uh, our, our social reality on is an idea that our brain is a muscle. Our brain is a muscle. It's just like a bicep in the sense that our brain can be trained, it can be fit, or it can atrophy and it can die. And so if our brain is a muscle, and self-control matters a lot, work out your brain. Increase your self-control. Y'all been to the grocery store, y'all notice that at the end of the checkout lines in every single grocery store, they have the impulse purchases, right? Mm -hmm. They have the gum, candy. the candy. What else do they have? Bagels. Soda. Magazines, soda. The, the, uh, the, the magazines are always like the gossip magazines. Yeah. yeah, good, good. So why do you think they do that? All grocery stores do that. Why do you think they do that? <coughs> People can wait. So when they wait, waiting, they saw the product and they tend to, okay, have a grab one. Yeah. You have a captive audience there. And no one puts Us Weekly on their grocery list, do they? Say, I'm going to go in and I'm going to get Us Weekly. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe some people do, but not very many. They do that because your brain gets tired when it's shopping. You're constantly making hundreds and hundreds of different decisions right, about what product to buy. And, and, and they're little. They don't cost a lot cognitively, but they do wear you out eventually. And this research, coming from this guy uh, named Baumeister, who's at Florida State, found that when your willpower is depleted, you make dumb decisions. Think about that for a minute. When you're, will pout, when you're cognitively tired, your brain, like a muscle, when it's tired, you make stupid decisions. A really high proportion of fights in a marriage happen right before dinner. Why would that be? 
Same kind of idea, right? You come home from work, you haven't eaten, your brain is tired, you make stupid decisions, you say stupid stuff. This is the effect of a little bit of, of, of alcohol and dumb decisions. Alcohol makes you dumber because it wears out your brain. It lowers your inhibition, so you do stupid things when you drink too much. All right, take that idea and now flip it on its head. This research, according to Baumeister, is kind of cool because it says that if your brain is a muscle, it can get depleted entirely and you can make that decision. But you can also work it out. You can also make it fit. You can also train it in a way that you'll make the right decision, in a way that you'll have more self-control. How can we do that? Let me do, do, do this for me. Everybody close your eyes real quick. I want you to imagine where you woke up this morning. Now I want you to imagine, think about what the bed looks like right now. Is it May? All right, open up. Here's what the research tells us. If your bed was May right now, you're more likely to be, you're likely to be more productive, you have a greater sense of well-being, and you're better at sticking to a budget. Think about how weird that is. This research is from, this book, uh, it's from a book called Habit, written by Charles Duhigg. He found that making your bed is one of those little things. It's easy. It doesn't really make a lot of sense, of course, because you're just going to get in it later. So why make it, right? But he says it's one of those symbolic things that says, if I'm willing to take the three or four minutes and make my bed in the morning, I'm also willing to eat right. And I'm also willing to be kind to the janitor. And I'm also willing to not eat that dessert. Or I'm also willing to work out. Or I'm also willing to study harder. Or I'm also willing to get off Facebook. Or I'm also willing to shut down my phone when I know I need to write something that requires thought. I'm also willing to call my mom because I know she misses me. You know what I mean? And the beauty of this idea that willpower is important and self-control can be improved is that you can do it with little stuff. And Duhigg, who wrote this book called Habits, says one of the classic examples of that is sitting up straight. So let's think about it. <laughs> Does it take a lot of effort to sit up straight? Does it take a lot of effort to run a lap around Clark Field, right? Well, so why would you do it? You're just going in one place. Well, you do it because it's an opportunity to exercise your willpower. Think about this when your alarm goes off in the morning. I had a football coach, our defensive coordinator, who's a little bit crazy as a lot of defensive coordinators are. He woke up at 4 o'clock every morning, and when his alarm went off, he told us about this. The first thought he had in his mind was he's going to war. And the first battle in that war is with his blankets. And he's not going to start the day with a loss. It's pretty wild, isn't it? He's going to war, and the blankets are the enemy, and the alarm goes off. You think he hits the snooze button? No way. He wakes up angry. <laughs> he throws the blanket. Takes a cold shower every morning. No matter the temperature, cold shower. Because he wants to carve a toughness groove in his brain. Look at that. A toughness groove in his brain. Is he married? <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be married to him. Yeah. But yeah, I like that idea. <laughs> it doesn't really matter if you hit the snooze button a couple times. It's only a few minutes. Well, think about it from the sense that every time you do hit the snooze button, you're admitting that you can't get, it, get up. You're admitting that you can't do it. And it's just like sitting up straight. It doesn't really matter. The example they use in this book also is uh, profanity. If you cuss a lot, it would take mental discipline for you to try to cuss less. Or if you have wandering eyes, you know what I mean? If you're checking out that girl a little too long, it would take mental discipline to knock that off. And it wouldn't affect things in a really <coughs> important material way, but just like sitting up straight, you can train yourself to increase your willpower. And once you do that with the little stuff, when those big marshmallows come around, that's when you can turn them down. Just like a bicep that's in shape, when it really matters, if you've done the little things before it, you can turn it down and you can make the right decision. I think that's important. We talk about this for a second. A common, um, we hear this a lot, how busy college students are, don't we? 
I'm sure many of y'all would consider yourselves very busy. And again, that's why I'm glad y'all are here. I really appreciate you coming tonight. Uh, but the research tells us you're not. <laughs> In the 1950s, college students spent between 50 and 60 hours per week either in class or doing homework for that class. So the idea is if you take 15 units, you're supposed to spend about three hours per unit outside of class. So what's that, 45? Students now spend an average of 26 hours per week, either in class or doing work for that class. 26 hours per week is barely a part-time job. You're not that busy. Now here's where we step back and say, wait a second. I'm on the football team, or I work a full-time job. So okay, you might be busy. <laughs> but those of you that are going to class, and class is your job, and dad's cutting the check, and it's all good as long as you keep your GPA up, you're not that busy. You're barely working a part-time job. Now this might be different for UT students. I know that. But it's important to consider that idea. And I think this is true. I think that you have more flexible time now than you will the rest of your life. If you're busy and stressed now, you're screwed. <laughs> because the rest of your life will be much more busy and much more stressed. So really, you might be busy and stressed, but you need to consider how you're spending your time. And I think that's another example of an area that we consider. If, 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 we, are, if we are thinking deeply about what we want, is that, are you going to find that on Facebook? Are you going to find that on your phone? You know, are you going to find that on Breaking Bad? We all got 24 hours a day, in a day, you know what I mean? And so, I, again, if you're answering the question, what is it that you want, think deeply about how you spend your time. All right, let me close with this. We live in the richest country in the history of all humanity. We also live in the most peaceful time in human history. It's hard to believe that, but it's true. Crime rates have dropped. No country is at war with another country right now. And that's unprecedented in the state of human history. Um, and many of us are in that situation because we won what Warren Buffett calls the, the lucky sperm club, the, the lucky, or the ovarian lottery. <laughs> you happen to be born in the United States in this time period where there is ungodly amounts of wealth. Y'all know what someone from Mogadishu would do with that right now? You know what someone from, from, from any other time in human history would do with all you can eat pasta? But yeah, it's no big deal for us. It's not a big deal. We are very, very, very blessed. And you didn't do anything to do that other than choose your parents wisely. <laughs> you know what I mean? So yeah, life is hard. But you have all the pasta you can fit in your belly, right? It's not that. You have shoes on your feet. Here we are talking about ideas. <coughs> and there's no one going to come in here with a gun and shoot us up. We don't have to worry about our safety. We have clothes on our backs. The temperature is just lovely. We are very, very lucky. If you think about it relative to every other human that's ever lived, we are very lucky. And with that love, with that sense of being blessed, comes a sense of responsibility. And again, get back to that question, what do you want? Well, given all the advantages that you have, that you didn't earn, given all the advantages that you have, it's very important that you pursue with all the passion you can muster what it is that you want. Because I don't want you to graduate and get a job that's all right, and get married, get a mortgage payment, and then retire, and then look back and think, crap, I wish I could have done it another way. That's, that's the saddest story of all. I think that's someone that doesn't think deeply about what they want. So start with that question. What is it that you want? And what do you need to do now on a day-to-day -day basis to ensure that you can get it? All right? Thank you.